This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being. Being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. <laughs> Who speaks for the wisdom that comes from the heart? Can people be taught to listen to what the heart does when top-down and bottom-up information is fed to the center of the person listening? Yes, they can. Many excellent therapists do this automatically, their knowledge coming through the compassion and connection felt in their own hearts. We sometimes see this as working with the counter-transference. That sounds professional and very important. It's also something that many therapists struggle to understand. When that dynamic is translated into hear what's being said, notice how you feel, body and mind, and let your heart speak the truth that emerges from that. It becomes organic and much simpler to understand and use constructively with clients. Our hearts connect with each other. The mind and body help the heart remain grounded and centered, freeing it to share in powerful ways beyond just top-down or bottom-up only approaches. Valeria Tellis interviews Lisa Danilchuk, the author of How You Can Heal, A Strength-Based Guide to Trauma Recovery. Lisa Danilchuk, LMFT, E-R-Y-T, is an author, licensed psychotherapist, and founder of the Center for Yoga and Trauma Recovery. A graduate of UCLA and Harvard University, her work has pioneered the field of trauma-informed yoga and transformed our understanding of embodiment practices in therapeutic work. More than 300 providers from over 25 countries have completed Lisa's Yoga for Trauma, Y4T, online training program, the first virtual program to train providers offering yoga for trauma recovery. She serves on the board and as UN committee co-chair for the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Disassociation, was elected to the role of secretary in 2018 and was nominated president-elect in 2020. She's written for publications like Good Therapy and the American Psychological Association and was named one of the top 20 inspirational yoga teachers to follow in 2016. Honored as one of Lululemon's first U.S. ambassadors, her blog has also been recognized as a top 25 yoga blog. Meet Lisa at howwecanheal.com. Here is the interview with Lisa Danilchuk. In your own words, who is Lisa Denilchuk? <laughs> That's a great question. How many words do I have? <laughs> I mean, and you're asking this as someone who's very interested in identity too. So I think the first few things we say when someone says, who are you, is really important. I'm an energy of love. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, yes. I, the, the classic things I'm, mm. you know, I, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. I've always been really interested in healing. I've always been really interested in, in academia as well and studying healing. And obviously I'm a human being as well. So I've been through all my own ups and downs and ins and outs and navigated my own losses and experiences. And so at the whole of what I'm at least doing professionally is trying to share that um, with other people. And I know there's been no shortage of challenges and um, ups, downs, ins and outs, left and rights in the last couple of years in particular. So, so I'm really glad to be here and thank you for having me. What do you think or feel is the purpose of the human experience? That is such an excellent and profound question. And I think a lot of people say, especially in spiritual communities, that it's learning and it's growth. Um, and I've, I've 
worked, you know, as a psychotherapist uh, with a lot of different forms of trauma and even the sort of, while some people, the narrative that everything happens for a reason or everything happens to teach us something works, I think the more, I almost want to say the more gruesome the trauma yeah. or the more you know, violent or gruesome or, or sadistic even, the harder it is to, for some people, I think some people still find that that meaning, but I think the harder it is to, for me, even as a listener, to embody that with the other person or to, right. to hold that, oh, this happened so you could learn compassion and you could learn love. It's like, well, I think you could have learned compassion, you know, not to be confrontational, but like without being raped as a child, right? right. Like I don't, yeah. Yeah. it's really difficult when you, and I think it's important we face these bigger traumas and experiences when we are creating a, a really wide narrative like that. So I do feel though that there is some energy of evolution that happens, um, an evolution of, of humanity and that so many people I have worked with who've been through the most horrific of traumas really do find within themselves an energy of love, of compassion, of maybe not tolerance for what happened to them, but transcendence of it so that they're able to be conscious enough of what's happening inside themselves and their reactions to their trauma and the impact of the trauma and the impact of trauma across generations that they then choose not to embody it and continue it. And I think that's one of the most powerful things we can do as human beings is, is be self-aware enough mm -hmm. most of the time yeah. as much as possible yeah. Yeah. to not pass down a legacy of harm or of of trauma or of, of violence or I think in spiritual terms we might say of separation yeah. so yeah. so when you ask what why are we here or what is the yeah. purpose or what does it mean to be embodied as a human being I do find that when people, often through yoga meditation and, and other similar practices, find a steadiness or an energy, uh, whether it feels they, they describe it within themselves or outside of themselves through a religion or a spiritual practice, when there's an energy of love, compassion, you know, unconditional love, universal compassion, that really seems to be transformative. And, and so I've come to lean into that and trust into that. And when you are in those really heavy or confrontational, challenging to make sense of traumas, at the very least, or, you know, at the most, we can lean into a sense of, of empathy, of compassion, and of, of the truth that we all are vulnerable to to that harm. And, and that seems to go in the direction of connecting us and that, you know, at a physiological and spiritual level tends to feel like a good thing for me <laughs> and yeah. for others too, from what I hear. So, so to boil it down, I would say connection, mm -hmm. compassion, mm -hmm. and evolution. How did you come to these understandings, Lisa? Do you have personal experience with trauma at that level that you had to transcend through yoga and in spirituality or through your work? I would say through all of it. Um, yeah. All of it has contribute, contributed to that, yeah. that, you know, lens or that way of understanding things or seeing the world. I will say um, in my own experience of trauma, which, you know, when I was 22, my brother died really suddenly and that was very impactful for me. And I, as someone who was already doing yoga and studying psychology, I mean, I kind of dove into it head first and I did a ton of yoga. Yoga was the most mm. helpful thing for me at that mm. point in my life. But I also feel like, and I know other people who felt this way too, and obviously every experience is unique, but when there's a loss of love in the form of a, a person and someone passes, it's really interesting to see at the same time of that loss, the amount of love that's also present in the missing them, but also in the rest of life. Mm, yeah. And so for me, I felt as much as I felt grief and I felt, you know, shock or loss or all the feelings. I mean, we could go on for hours with the yeah. list of the feelings. Yeah. I also felt a really deep connection to to people around me and to an energy of love and of, of service or of supporting other people. 
so I started doing some, I think there's like a, a, almost a craving for depth that can come with a really deep experience of loss or of trauma. And so that can be its own gift too, where we go from, you know, you can hear people who feel sad or depressed or have experienced a significant loss questioning everything and questioning doesn't have to, you know, that can be a great thing and you can dig really deep and then, and then find things that are the most meaningful for you, that are the most worthy of your life energy. And, and yeah, I'm just not, I'm not the only one I know that's felt a great loss, but at the same time, a really abounding presence of love in the same, by the same token, so it's an interest. So I think that very much informs mm. my understanding. And it's sort of a, I'm sure there are people who are listening who go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And probably others who are like, huh, what? How does that work? <laughs> yes, and, right. <laughs> and we all have our own experiences, but that was definitely a big part of mine. So it's it's infused my work. And like I said, I've I've seen it show up in a lot of different ways with other people as well. So the way you speak, it sounds to me like love, it's always there. So it just takes different forms, but it's always there. It never goes away. I love the way you say that many times, the energy of love and energy. How would you describe love, Lisa? Is that the same as compassion? I would say that they're connected, but not necessarily the same. I feel like compassion, there's some amount of understanding and empathy in that. And you know, when I say love, it's again, like digging deep underneath all forms of that, right? There's yeah. familial love and romantic love and love for pets and love for the earth and love for things you do or your passions. And I think I say the energy of it because there's something deeper or more transcendent there that I'm not sure I can really put mm. words to, but I would, I would say that it's something that I, I have felt and feel in really deep yoga practices or meditations, you know, we, we talk about the fluctuations of our minds and how our minds are always sort of stewing and brewing and processing, which isn't a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But when that surface of the lake calms down and we can see through the depths, like what, what else is there? And I feel like that, that's what I would describe as that energy of love. And, and my personal mm -hmm. feelings and understanding is that we just all have that within us somehow, somewhere you know, obviously I'm open to listening to other people's experiences if they don't feel they have that or if they feel like it's different, that's fine. Um, but I even feel it in nature and mm. trees and still moments. And so it feels bigger than just humans right. to me. And it feels like a larger, I think you, I could call it a, a larger spiritual force, but again, it feels sort of constrained by words. Yeah. It seems like there's no way to describe that. I love the way you say that it's, um, in a way, what you're trying to describe is beyond thoughts, beyond mental activity. And that's what we see in nature. It's uh, no stories. It's very, I mean, saying a lot, but in, in a very profound, uh, in a different way, let's say. And I remember, yeah, and I remember reading, I think it was from Anne Frank, who obviously went through, you know, horrific traumatic experiences saying that if you can just go outside and be with the elements, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but then, then all of a sudden there's this sense that everything really is okay. Mm, despite right. all of the challenges and all of the horrific things that we see in the world, there can be, I suppose that might come across as peace too. Right. But just some, some energy that's bigger than our limited perspective. Is healing a destination per se? Can we come to the point of saying that we are healed or healing is an ongoing process? I would absolutely call it a process. I would absolutely yeah. call it a process. Um, and I think there's a very thankfully popular and common narrative now that it's not linear. So we know it's not an yeah. ABCD process or a follow the five steps and you're done process. Right. Particularly, I think with grieving too, it, it can be iterative or circular or all kinds of, you know, growing like a vine all over the place and, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. searching for, for light through the night yeah. and the dark and the, and the daytime and everything. But, um, I think there are times we can say, all right, you know, I had this experience and I've processed the emotions around it. I've learned some things from it and, you know, it's not alive. The, the pain from that experience isn't alive in me anymore. So I do think 
as much as it's iterative and ongoing, I do think it's possible to feel like I've healed from that. Or, you know, somebody asked me recently, you know, what would you say with losing your brother on a scale of zero to 10, zero being I haven't healed anything and 10, I healed everything. And I said nine, because I was like, I, of course, I still miss him when I think of him, you know, it's never going to be, I'm never going to feel like glad or okay or neutral that that happened, but I've done a lot of work and it doesn't, doesn't feel like it interrupts my day or my life or it's this, you know, such a present process as it was, especially for the first few years. And so I think it absolutely depends on the experience and the individual, but, but I do believe there's power in knowing that we can come to a place where even if it's, it's a nine out of 10, we say, yeah, I've healed a lot from that. I've healed from that. I'm still a human and I'm still working on whatever comes up day to day. And who knows, you know, maybe another piece will arise next week and I'll work with it. But, but there's a sense of integration with it. And there's not a sense that it's, it's interrupting, right? It's more connected. I love that this idea of integration, which comes to this understanding that we need to be open to life to both everything that comes, good and bad, because this is the experience in the human body. It, it seems like it wouldn't be possible without these um, opposites. So mm. it's like this interesting dance. Right. And I mean, I don't think people really feel a lot of grief for people they didn't feel deeply connected to and mm. have have a lot of love for, yeah. right? I mean, there's losses mm. feel different. And when someone's a major part of your life and your heart, it's a very different experience than if they're peripheral or you don't even know them. Uh, as sad as that is in general, it's not as emotionally impactful. So there's that, you know, as much love as there is, is as much grief as there is. And, um, mm. and then hopefully as much love sort of shows up in the absence of that person too. But it's hard to measure these things or use those terms like as much of this, but, right. but it is interesting to see that, you know, grief really is an expression of, of love. I guess I'll ask you questions about what do you do? Yoga. How did you discover yoga, Lisa? I showed up at UCLA as an undergrad and wanted to try something new that I'd never done before and signed up for a class at the recreation center. And that's how it all started. It was just a curiosity moment. And I remember, you know, struggling to breathe in downward dog and, you know, (laughs) there being sort of things at UCLA. So there were a couple famous names in class. <laughs> like I remember yeah. being like, wow, what is this thing and where am I? And at the time, I still very much had the, I had a very, I think an older projection of what yoga was. I thought I, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area and Berkeley just across the Bay where there's kind of a hippie style presence there that that's what I associated yoga with at that time. And I think nowadays we have a very different association with it or or younger people I've talked to have different associations. Uh, But I just wanted to try something and it stuck. (laughs) I went from one class to the next to the next until I said, okay, there's no more classes here. What studio do I go to? And then I moved to Italy and had to find yoga right away because it was such a big part of my life. And it just kept going on from there. So what is it about yoga that is uh, attracts more women than men from what I see? I'm not sure if that's true, but it mm. seems to me. So talk to me about that for a moment. What is it about yoga that's so healing? And why does it attract more women than men? I mean, we have to kind of dive into some, you know, generalizations or Mm. gender stereotypes to answer that question, which I'm, you know, I think we can do, but I would, two things come to mind. And one is being nurturing, getting in touch with your emotions, observing, observing yourself and others in a certain way that I think women are, you know, perhaps there's a biology to this, but also socialized to, you know, process our emotions in groups more and talk, you know, connect with friends and be really, open and vulnerable, whereas men are not really socialized to talk about their feelings. You know, there's a lot of don't cry, suck it up, be a man. I think that yeah. still exists today, even if not in, not so much maybe in my circles, but uh-huh. it's there, you know, we hear it and we see it. And the other piece I would just say in terms of physicality that I don't know any sort of stats or research on this, but it seems that, 
you know, women are a little more pliable (laughs) (laughs) physically. And so, uh, you know, there's always exceptions, but every, every yoga for men class that I've seen or intro to yoga for men class that I've seen marketed is all about, you don't have to be bendy. You can sit like, we're going to use a lot of props and you can do this and you can do it. And I do hear, you know, even as a yoga teacher for over 20 years now, I've, I've had a lot of men say to me, well, I'm not flexible enough for yoga. And I've heard fewer, I have heard women say that and, and other genders, you know, um, transgender and non-binary people say similar things. I'm not flexible or I don't, I feel like I need to get in shape before I go to yoga class. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, just like yeah. we say that for the gym, people yeah. say that for yoga. So I think there's a physicality where men tend to probably want to excel at something and not have to face that, you know, yeah. Yeah. bendiness that sure. seems to be a little easier for female bodies. And then also mm. the, the element of, oh, now we're going to really dive into like, how are you feeling now? And how are you mm. feeling now? And what's going on now? And, mm. and that can be mm. a lot if you're socialized to just plow through it. Yeah, that's sad to hear, isn't it? That we are socialized to basically suffer. <laughs> um, yeah. And it happens wow. to women and people of all genders, yeah. but yeah. there's there's yeah. definitely a tough guy narrative out there. that It definitely exists. So you wrote the book, many other books, but uh, the one for today that I would love to talk to you about briefly is the How You Can Heal, A Strength-Based Guide to Trauma Recovery. Talk to me about the inspiration and intention of writing this book, Lisa. Yeah, so it kind of fits in with the others. You know, my first book was Embodied Healing, and I, I wanted to write about yoga and trauma recovery. And so I wrote a little bit about my own experience and kind of general terms of, you know, what the basis of why why yoga for trauma recovery. Mm-hmm. And then one of the things I've found is that writing about trauma, <laughs> like all of a sudden we're already going into potentially some really serious and confronting emotions and experiences. And so, and this was also part of my master's work was to look at, well, how do we, you know, yes, there's trauma. Yes, there are these challenges. How do we bolster people? How do we access resilience and, you know, sort of bring in prevention and early intervention. And one of the concepts there that's been really consistent for me throughout my career is something called resourcing, which is psychological resourcing, meaning connecting with positive memories or, you know, imaginal resources, things in your imagination or based on maybe positive stories or narratives you've heard or people you've known or movies even or, you know, fictional characters. So we can use our minds and our bodies to find a soothing and supportive space. We can connect with feeling protected or nurtured or inspired um, through different avenues. And so How You Can Heal is a book that's all, you know, don't even really talk about trauma. (laughs) It's more just these are all these resources. And it's it's informed by yoga in that it follows the chakra system. There's, you know, a flow to the entire book in terms of where we start and how you're resourcing, but but it's also just a ton of ideas of how you could ground yourself, center yourself, support yourself when, when things are, are very difficult and you're feeling overwhelmed or challenged by a stressful experience, an emotional experience, a traumatic experience, a pandemic, (laughs) you know, it's, I've, I've given that book away so many times in the last couple of years because it's just so relevant. And I think as much as people are processing a lot of emotions, sort of collectively, we're doing that, even processing gets exhausting, right? Like really feeling your grief and really feeling your anger and sorting through why and sorting through how and understanding intergenerational trauma, like all of that stuff is a lot. And so the in the moment resourcing and yoga is very much a part of that. Breathing can be a huge part of that can rather than being in that really big picture, it can take you into, okay, this is what's happening right now. And these are my five senses. And this is what I need right now. And this is what I'm going to give myself right now. And a lot of times we, you know, try to regulate our minds with our minds, like this is how I'm feeling. So I'm going to think differently or I've got (laughs) a strategy. True. But when we use and really embody and you know, bring our bodies in and, and use embodied practices, like we can look to our bodies for self-regulation almost more mm, than the so mental true. strategies. And I think we kind of forget there's a very 
you know, mind body approach is like, there's like, there are two different things we can kind of forget that like our head and our thoughts are like, they're on top of something. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's always there and it's all very connected. So using our breath and using movement and using Mm. just different, even physiological practices, (laughs) um, creative practices can, can, be of a great service. And so that's, that's where how you can heal came from. And like I said, I think it's just relevant, so relevant today and in an ongoing way. I mean, I use these things all the time, yeah, all the time. Yeah. I love and your work. And my clients yeah. do too. Thank you. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense to me. When I think about those components, the body, the mind, um, which is mental, emotional activities, and then the spirit, or maybe the energy of love, the we spoke earlier. I wonder if we can bring that also get to not know, but realize that more often that presence of undescribable love, because this is something that I'm very interested in and not just moving from my head to my body, which I do often, but also expanding to the place of love that's untouchable. That is very abstract. The mind cannot grasp have you tapped into that in the sense of um, even writing about it, Lisa? That this all this space of the spirit, the soul, or whatever we call it. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I'm thinking of two things as you're talking, mm-hmm. and one of them is when I when I got the feeling that I wanted to write. I had those little um, like alphabetized the sentence magnets on my fridge. I don't remember where I got them, but you know, when you can have those, you can create a sentence with magnets. Yeah, yeah. And I pulled the one that said right. And I pulled the one that said love. And it was at the top mm. of my fridge for mm. so long that it like turned brown and withered. <laughs> <laughs> it <was still> somewhere. <laughs> but it was just like right love. Mm. And so I mm. do feel very connected to it in that way. And, and one of the other things mm. that comes to mind is as you're talking about that mind body connection is we talk in trauma-informed yoga about top down where we're sort of put my foot here put my hand there and that happens in yoga obviously and then bottom up which is like well what does my body want what does it need what is it you know what kind of movement is it sort of calling for which is very different than sort of putting yourself into a form or a shape or a yoga pose and there's another one, though, and, and I have to credit my mom because I this came from speaking with her. It's like, what about the center out? You know, what about mm. from your heart? And it's like, oh, yeah. And so I ended up writing about that. I think it's in my third book, yeah. Yoga for Trauma Recovery. But But I think that's a lot of what happens in therapeutic work, whether sometimes we're aware of it, sometimes we're not. But there's and that's what comes back to, I think, that compassion. And you know, when most of us have a sense a vibe a feeling when we're sitting with someone and they're, they're empathizing, they're feeling with us or they're compassionate, they care, they, they, you know, have an understanding of how that might have impacted us. Like, so when there's a sense of heart there, that's very different. And then just, I'm telling my body to do this or I'm self-regulating. Right. (laughs) So, but being in that space, I think, is a very self-regulating experience, mm-hmm. right? I mean, I can think of the times when I feel really connected, like now even in in nature, I'll be, you know, looking at a tree or I'll be climbing a mountain and looking at a view or just, you know, smelling pine or something. And I can feel some of that. And so I think it's unique for people what connects them. But I do feel like that's what spiritual and even sometimes religious practices are are seeking right like how do i stay connected to this instead of getting distracted by all of those you know all of the things in life or work or all these thoughts how do i sort of go back to center and it's interesting when you ask people to point to themselves they don't usually point to their head, right? They're usually pointing to like the center of their chest. <laughs> like, mm. oh, that's me. Yeah. And and it's funny because yeah. even in yoga and energy medicine, the center is usually down in your belly, but I haven't really seen people say me and point to their abdomen either. So there's <laughs> <laughs> something really interesting about that, that we sort of identify. Mm. And, and, you know, maybe that's just learned because you've seen other people do it. Yeah. But for the most part, people feel some sort of centralized, you know, mm-hmm. some sort of center there, some sort of identity or connection. Um, so it's an interesting space to to explore. And it it's um, always going to be unique, but 
There does seem to be like when we hug, we put our hearts together, right? When we, there's something about it. So you are the founder of the Center for Yoga and Trauma Recovery. And also you have a um, online training program called Yoga for Trauma, Y4T. So talk to me about these two companies of these two works that you do, Lisa. Yeah, so the Center for Yoga and Trauma Recovery, I founded in 2017 and started doing some in-person workshops in Oakland, California. Everything's online now. Um, And Yoga for Trauma is the kind of flagship course and the primary training for the Center for Yoga and Trauma Recovery. And the goal is really to educate yoga professionals, mental health professionals, and even, you know, allied health and wellness professionals in trauma-informed practice and how yoga can be healing, but also how it can be triggering and where things, we've seen things go wrong and people be harmed even within yoga and meditation and, and spiritual communities. So it's um, the, the Y4T program, you know, that's really just the shorthand I started using because I was writing yoga for trauma over and over again everywhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. I was like, Let okay, make it too, easier. Yeah, too many letters here, <laughs> kind of like my last name. <laughs> so that's a kind of foundational program in trauma-informed principles and, and really builds, you know, from you know, healthy dynamics and and into somatic practices, understanding our nervous system, understanding yoga philosophy, not just, you know, the shapes and the practice. And then kind of concluding with like, how do we offer this to different, different groups of people? Trauma isn't uniform. It doesn't always act a certain way. I mean, there's certain biological things that are common, but, you know, we need to really be responsive in offering trauma-informed care and trauma-informed yoga. So that's a foundational eight-week program. I also run a nine-month advanced training and mentorship program where we read nine books throughout the season. We do individual support calls and monthly support consultations with the group. So that's kind of the advanced version of the program. So both of those are housed under the Center for Yoga and Trauma Recovery. And I think as you saw, you know, some of those, the graduates of the advanced training are now kind of stepping into bigger leadership roles within the trauma-informed yoga uh, world. And so I've kind of had them on as guest blogs on the website and they're kind of offering their own unique, authentic way of sharing the work all over the world, uh, which is really cool to see. Cause I know when I started doing this work, I, I definitely felt very alone. People would say, what do you do? <laughs> like, huh? ah, yeah, How does yeah. that work? <laughs> and so it's nice to be, you know, the center is really meant to be um, training grounds, but also a place to build community around the work because it it just didn't exist when I started. And so I figured, hey, if I don't see anybody else doing it in the way that feels really good to me, I'll do it myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's cre- being creative, right? I love what you do, Lisa. What you do, how you do it, the way you express your enthusiasm for the work, um, your knowledge, your wisdom. I love your wisdom or the wisdom, universal wisdom that you allow to flow through you. It's really beautiful. It can be felt in the sound of your voice, the way you express it and and that love (laughs) that cannot be described. It's really, really beautiful. Thank you for your presence in this reality. A blog post that you wrote, it's titled what got me through the last four years. Mm-hmm. And then you have yeah, focus, love, commitment, rest. Mm-hmm. That's insightful. Would you like to make a comment about that blog post and why yeah. you wrote it? I think um, I wrote it in a time where it felt to me like there were so many things being triggered. Like people, the people I work with, you know, I have... I have clients who are different genders, different sexualities, um, different racial and ethnic backgrounds. And, you know, I wrote it after a time in the U.S. where I feel like a lot of people who have those identities or have varying identities felt excluded, felt threatened, felt oppressed, felt not welcome or not celebrated, um, not included. And so honestly felt to me like my job was just so much harder because leadership dynamics and power dynamics, you know, 
they're they're powerful <laughs> and mm-hmm. um, they yeah. set the yeah. stage for how we feel day to day. Do we feel safe enough? Do we feel supported? And these are attachment words. Do you feel mm-hmm. soothed? Do you feel supported? Do you feel safe? Do you feel secure? And for a long time there, you know, most of the people I support weren't feeling that way because of kind of the messages they were getting from, from leadership at the time. And so what got me through was definitely like committing to supporting those people, taking more rest breaks and that sort of slow, steady one day at a time, one thing at a time, I'm doing what I can sort of approach. And I do think even after, you know, I also love hiking and trail running and I've done a lot of trail runs in my life and, and it's, you know, there's like a pacing, there's an element of like pacing and appreciating where you are and, you know, embracing the positive moments and breathing into the challenging moments. And so I think way back on the blog there, there's like, life is like an ultra marathon. Right? Yeah, <laughs> right. like, you it just that. keeps going and there's another <laughs> hill around the corner. And yeah. Sometimes it's downhill and it's fun and you feel great. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times there's just work and unexpected things or you know an animal on the trail or whatever right and so yeah I I really wrote that in in hopes of just sharing tools to get through difficult things and it was interesting because I usually don't write things that have any sort of political context to them but I felt that it was really important for me to share that as a trauma therapist because it so directly impacted mm. my work. And I got a few responses that were saying, oh, well, what about compassion? And, you know, I, I think in the way I wrote it, I wasn't trying to judge anyone or make any political statements other than this the reality that I saw that, like, this has really been hard for, you know, people who basically had entire departments dedicated to protecting them that then the entire, you know, page got deleted from the website <laughs> yeah. and all of a sudden you go, no, what? <laughs> um, and so, you know, I can have really big scaled back conversations about compassion and all of that, but it also just felt so important for me to say and value, you know, what I saw and to not just like speak up on behalf of it, but to speak it, right. Just to, yeah. to be clear about it. Yeah. And, and I know, you know, here in the U.S. at least there's in the last I don't know how many years but (laughs) there's been just a lot of hard conversations happening and so I think we can we can celebrate those and when we do have strong reactions to something or we feel defensive we can go okay well what's what's going on there uh, and explore it a little more and you know it's still even with that take rests and (laughs) know what you're valuing and what you're committed to and pace ourselves. What a beautiful place to come from. Yeah, curiosity and also expression, being honest and genuine. Some of us call it being authentic. That's what you're doing as well. That's one more thing. And um, speaking of power, not that you mentioned that word, I have a question for you. We're almost at the end. I have so many other questions, but I have to add this one. What is true power to you, Lisa? Oh, yeah, we could do, we could go on for another whole. Oh, yes, right, right. Yeah, Um, for sure. One expression that comes to mind that's important to me is when we think of power, we're often thinking about power over and power under, but power with um, Mm. feels really important to me and to the work that I do where we really are stronger when we can be interdependent and collect our strengths and in some capacity work together. So I feel like we often think of power in terms of, well, this is the leader and this is the follower instead of this is the leader and this is the other leader (laughs) or this is the specialist here and this is the specialist there. This is the voice for this and this is the voice for that. And, you know, the other concepts that comes to mind when there is that hierarchical power um, is this something called rational authority and this comes from Eric Fromm who's written a lot and it's in I think it's in his book to have or to be but rational authority he defines as others are dependent on this authority and the authority is seeking to serve those that are dependent it's going okay how do we best take care of you could think of it in a family like a parent that's going what's best for the child that's rational authority and irrational, irrational authority is seeking to exploit. So it's, well, how do I, you know, how do I get something out of this 
child child or this citizen or this whatever else. And so that's another way I think we can kind of organize our thinking around power is, it, and sometimes we kind of shy away from being in a place of power because it usually has responsibility to say, you know, with great power comes great responsibility mm, yeah. And so yeah, yeah. or with any leadership position, right? But we can bring in, okay, well, I'll be in rational authority. I'm, and people talk a lot about service here. I'll be in service, but I'll also still claim, yes, I, I do have decision-making power or I have some leadership power here. And then we can also think of power with. So it's like, how do I develop a council around me or how do I support people who maybe are quote unquote followers or dependents in, you know, making choices that are empowering for them instead of just being the only one. Right. So we could go on forever. <laughs> True. On this, but those yeah. are, those yeah. are a few things that come to mind. And, and I think with mm. that, you know, we talked about, or I talked about feeling like everyone has love within them. And I think we all have power too, but it's really challenging to sometimes to connect with it or to you know, sometimes we get lost in different dynamics that are that are really powerful and we <laughs> the dynamics can be powerful too mm-hmm. you know and so sometimes we kind of forget that we have even just the power of choice right mm-hmm. we have the choice often not always but we have the choice of you know how we're thinking or what we're um, allowing in our lives or you know whether we go or stay or you know move forward or whatever it is. So I think looking to looking to what choices we do have and expanding that view as much as possible can also be really empowering. That very much sounds to me. Yeah, this being open, curious, yeah. That is a place of power if we can label that. You talked about earlier, uh, inspired by your mother, from the center out, you have that mm, as a blog mm-hmm. post, a different perspective on healing. And there you see, you write, our hearts connect with each other. The mind and body help the heart remain grounded and centered, freeing it to share in powerful ways beyond just top down or bottom up only approaches. I love that first part of this passage is just... Um, I mean, it means a lot to me in that sense, if there's meaning here. Our hearts connect with each other, right? It goes back to that love, that energy of love. I think I'm going to title this The Energy of Love. <laughs> this, I love this it. Podcast. Yeah, please. That's um, perfect. Yeah, and it's like a network, right? I mean, if you think of sometimes people talk about um, energetic cords and, you yeah. know, sometimes from the perspective of cutting them, but like, you think about the people you're connected to in your heart and the people they're connected to in their heart. And it just ends up exponentially just, you know, traveling all around the world at a certain point. Uh, and I think that's a really beautiful kind of web way to think that, that we don't always, we don't always get a lot of that imagery or hear a lot about that, but Right. We can feel it. <laughs> yes, right. We can feel it. That bigger picture. So my ending questions, before I ask them, I think I have a couple of them for you, Lisa. Would you like to add anything or read a passage in one of your books or your blog posts? You know, there's something on my wall that that maybe fits here. I have a quote from Rumi framed that I've had for the longest time and I carry it every time I move and I always put it up near where I practice yoga because I'll end up seeing it and something will resonate. But it just says, what is the body? Endurance. What is love? Gratitude. What is hidden in our chest? Laughter. What else? Compassion. And that's by Rumi. (laughs) This is something that you also explore that you make me smile. The entire interview, I have a smile on my face and giggling and uh that's a beautiful inspiration so you're coming yeah from that place chest heart oh i love Romy. who doesn't <laughs> so thank you for reading that so my ending questions for you let's see i'll ask yeah let me ask you this one what is another word for healing growth if you knew you would die soon, meaning leaving, losing the body, would you make any change or do anything in a different way? I would be on the computer less. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, right. Uh, yeah. I would say the same, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Ah, that's <laughs> funny, else right? I'd keep doing. I would keep <laughs> taking my dogs for walks. I'd keep going for hikes. I'd keep hugging my people, but I would... 
be on the computer less. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny how we spend a lot of time on our computers, yeah. And even that is life being life, isn't it? There's a need for that somehow. Mm-hmm. Somehow. And I mean, it connects us in a way that's so amazing and incredible and I'm so grateful for. But I joked when I was writing my last book, Yoga for Trauma Recovery, that I was like, I think for some people, the computer takes your energy and sucks it out of your face. <laughs> like I said to you earlier, my brother, my brother's a computer programmer and he got all the tech genes in the family. And I don't think it's true for him. He can sit in front of the computer for a very long time and be very happy. But for me, it feels like it just takes my chi and my life energy and pulls it out of my face and brings it somewhere else. That's interesting. Yeah, I think it depends, right? Yeah, it depends. It's a perspective yeah. again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're all different. Yeah, for sure. And my last question is, what are three things about life you wish everyone to have or know before they lose the body? Three things about life I wish for everyone to know or have before they lose the body. I, I you know, I wish for everyone to experience deep love and being cared for. I would wish for everyone to experience laughter <laughs> and joy. <laughs> And I would wish for everyone to, before they leave, have a positive experience of embodiment. Like, oh, wow, this is this is my body and it works. And even these are the ways that it does work. And these are the things I can do with it, right? Like, because before we leave, like, you know, how sad to have a whole journey where you can't enjoy the ride. Yeah. <laughs> and enjoy the experience. And right. so, yeah, right. those are the things I would wish. Thank you so much, Lisa. For your presence, your beautiful, elevated, fun, spiritually fun, that's what I call it. Uh, the wisdom mm. that flows through you, the way you express um, what you do, it's just beautiful. Yeah, thank you so much again. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor. And before we say goodbye, where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? Yeah, well, since I have a mouthful of a last name, um, I do have lisadanelshek.com, but also How We Can Heal is my primary website. So you can go to howwecanheal.com, and it's H-O-W and then another W-E, um, C-A-N-H-E-A-L.com, and then all the programs are there. That's basically the home for the Center in Yo- for Yoga and Trauma Recovery. Uh, all the training programs are there, tons of resources, all the blog posts you mentioned. There is also a page for just mental health resources, a lot of um, emergency contact numbers throughout the world. And there's also some videos and, and things. So there's, there's plenty of support, inspiration and um, information there for anyone who's interested. Yes. And I'll have the link on your podcast profile, too. Thank you so much again. And we'll talk soon. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. Bye for now. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Lisa Daniltrak and her work, please visit howwecanheal.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.